not seeing my slides. Let's see. Okay, here. You see that now? Yes, we see. Ah, wonderful. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let me begin by thanking uh, Peter Bologna and the CETRA board for inviting me. Uh, it's an enormous honor. Over the last several years, I've met a number of now very established scholars in the field of translation studies, and they inevitably describe their participation in the CETRA summer school as an absolutely seminal uh, event in their formation as scholars of translation. So I'm very, very happy to be uh, a part of this. Um, second, I want to lower expectations for my talk today. I have no uh, intention of presenting a new theory of translation or greatly expanding the field. Um, my ambitions are humbler. Uh, they come out of a t over 20 years teaching translation and translation theory at the undergraduate, the master's and the doctoral levels. So um, three abiding kind of research questions inform much of my work uh, over the last several years. I'm very interested in the whole cause of translation literacy. So I'm interested where do non-translators get their ideas about what translation is. I think this informs the broader status of translation and translators in society. And of course, these are the students that enter our classroom for the first time. And um, also, why are translation students so resistant to theory? Why are practitioners in general so re resistant to theory? And, and why theory matters, right? So if we think of theory as if we demystify it and, and think of it simply as a conceptualization of practice, I think it's absolutely necessary for developing uh, professional ethics and so on. Um, and then finally, of course, my work of the se last several years has focused on uh, productively integrating translation studies in Eastern Europe uh, with the Western uh, tradition and, and, and going beyond. Um, so, uh, let me begin by just saying, of course, the relationship between translation and semiotics is long standing. Uh, that being said, none of the so called founders of semiotics, who are all linguists, of course, so Saussure, Pierce, uh, Charbali, dealt with translation in a systematic and sustained way. All right, they mention translation, they give examples, etc., but there's no systematic understanding of translation. And so it's been left to scholars largely in the field of translation studies to flesh out the implications of semiotics for translation. Um, and that includes even second and third generation semioticians. M much of my work lately has been uh, trying to understand the implications of the work of the Moscow Tartu School for translation proper. Because of course, in other fields, translation is often used as a metaphor, which is valuable and productive, but I think it's important that we not lose sight of uh, translation proper in all that. So just to begin, as you know, uh, for Western scholars, Roman Jakobson's 1959 essay on linguistic aspects of translation marks a watershed moment in the relationship between translation and semiotics. Uh, largely because Jakobson in that very short essay does big things, right? He expands the notion of translation to include any representation of meaning. And that's what allows him to give his tripartite intralingual, interlingual, and intersemiotic translations. Um, of course, that's why uh, Maria Tomoshko in Enlarging Translation praises this essay as a crucial step toward what she calls a post positivist understanding of translation. Uh, Cobus Moray more recently uh, in his biosemiotic theory of translation criticizes the essay for being lingua centric. And later in this talk, I'll situate this essay in the polarized semiotic ecosystem of the Cold War. So yes, he expands translation, but in some ways he also narrows it by leaving out, uh, separating out literary translation where form and content are inseparable from what we consider to be translation proper. So 
most of the thinking on, uh, let's say, semiotics informed thinking on translation has followed Saussurean linguistics and this notion of a closed system in which meaning is defined by differences within the system, right? This is what produced structuralism and then post structural critiques of structuralism, but that's still built on that basic understanding that meaning is created out of difference. Uh, and of course, it was given its probably most sophisticated uh, presentation in the work uh, Derrida, of, of Jacques Derrida, uh, in which all representation of meaning is translation, which necessarily produces difference, not sameness, and so on. Uh, as Derrida argues, due to that arbitrary relationship between the signifier and the signified, meaning in language is endlessly deferred. This is his concept of difference, resulting in the ceaseless dissemination of meaning. So within this conceptualization of translation, translation is typically presented as a kind of paradox. And uh, Paul Ricoeur gave a very succinct description of this uh, paradox is, you know, translation is conceptually impossible because you cannot produce the same thing in another language, but it is, of course, constantly being done, right? It is ubiquitous, but impossible at the same time. So this very sophisticated and rich theorization of translation that emerged from Saussurean linguistics and exemplified in the work of Derrida is and has been especially effective in deconstructing the notion of formal equivalence or sameness, especially in the West, I should say, the Soviets kind of deconstructed uh, formal equivalence back in the 20s, but that's something for us uh, to discuss uh, in, in, in other forum. Uh, but translation was investigated I would argue not as a distinct practice. So again, this is my interest in the specific cultural work of translated text, which isn't really captured in these models because it's not seen as a distinct practice, but rather as a manifestation of the difference inherent in natural languages. In other words, translation exposes the workings of natural languages and the dialogic nature of all discourse. So this relates actually, that critique relates to the earliest critiques of Saussurean linguistics made by among others, uh, Bakhtin, uh, that it was ahistorical and that it ignored what Bakhtin referred to as the social life of language. So my, I guess the, the issue I'm dealing with today is how semiotics can connect us. And this is uh, present in Cobus Moray's recent work too, uh, present us or connect us to this social life of language and through that uh, to uh, history and broader uh, issues. So the fact that Darius does writing brilliantly theorizes the first part of the paradox, namely the dispersal or dissemination of meaning, one could say situates us within post-68 critiques of authority, right? The emphasis on the dispersal. And it's perhaps for this reason that this kind of theorization is often criticized by practitioners as utterly irrelevant to what they do. Uh, and students, we hear similar things. So for example, in Mark Polizzotti's uh, Pal uh, Sympathy for the a Traitor, he writes, a translation studies is one of the few disciplines in which uh, the study of a subject uh, is bent on demonstrating that very subject's impossibility. Uh, yeah, so this is a typical thing. So it's, I think, not a coincidence, and again, I'm not trying to draw a causal link, but it's interesting to me that when that line of thinking reaches this kind of dead end in untranslatability as theorized in comparative literature circles, we see this turn toward Piercean semiotics, right away from the Saussurean model to Pierce. And we see it again and again in the last 10 years in scholars working both in translation studies and adjacent to translation studies. So very interestingly, Anthony Pym uh, looks at the influence of Charles Bali and his work on stylistics, which was very relevant to me because the Russians and Ukrainians were quoting Bali uh, a lot in the 1920s and early 30s. Of course, in Venuti's New Contra Instrumentalism, he turns to Pearson semiotics to provide his model for a hermeneutics of translation. 
uh, works by D Dina Gorley and Doug Robinson, and, and their kind of debates between one another are based on Pearson uh, semiotics, and then Cobus Moray's recent work too turns to Pearson semiotics. So why Pierce now, and what can Pierce uh, and Pearson semiotics give? And I want to try to end with some suggestions of how it might actually be relevant to translation practice in a way that the Saussure-based theorizations have not been, or at least practitioners don't perceive it as terribly uh, relevant. So to return to Marais biosemiotic theory of translation. Now he's clearly, and he states this overtly, that he's attempting to write this imbalance in favor of an endless deferral of meaning to understand the opposite phenomenon, how meanings are actually stabilized in certain contexts, however provisionally, and how communication happens. So as he states, I explain why everything changes, but also why some things take uh, something stabilize and take form. Hence his interest in this notion of constraints uh, that may for at least uh, a moment stabilize meanings. My interest in semiotics is also informed by the work I've done translating Yuri Lutman's uh, semiotics informed writings. Uh, most recently this uh, volume on translation, I'm sorry, on cultural memory and history. Um, and I'm trying to understand the relevance of that for an understanding of translation. Um, one very interesting, um, I think, thing he proposes is a kind of relevance-based model of literary history, one in which, uh, which would be distinguished from the traditional origins based model, right? So if we write a history of 19th century literature, it's going to be works that were created in the 19th century and their origin is situated in the century. He suggests the possibility of a relevance-based model in which the texts that are relevant to a society at a certain point be uh, make up the history of that moment. So he has a nice quote from uh, Gogol when someone asked uh, the 19th century writer Nikolai Gogol or Ukrainian writer Nikolai Gogol, who the most important Russian writers, or I'm sorry, writers of that time were, uh, and he responds, again, this is the early 19th century, he responds, Sir Walter Scott and Homer. And of course, at that time, there was a major translation of Homer going on in Russia and so on. So what would history, literary history look like if we could free it from these romantic notions that privilege origins and originality. And I think it's pretty clear that translation um, uh, has, a, uh, has a, a stake in that, in rethinking translation history away from a romantic model based on origins. Um, and also my work is informed by uh, Bakhtin's work uh, in two different ways, his critique of Saussurean linguistics as he says here, truth is not born, nor is it to be found inside the head of an indi individual person. It is born between people collectively searching for truth in the process of their dialogic interaction. And here we see uh, clearly his uh, the commonalities his thinking had with Lev Vygotsky, the pedagogical Russian pedagogical theorist of this time, who also believed that learning takes place through dialogue. So this again, focus on process and dialogue as opposed to end products, which is uh, something I share with uh, Cobus Moray. And also, of course, uh, I find interesting Bakhtin's notion of the social life of language. And as he says that that social life of language is characterized by a constant struggle between centripetal and centrifugal forces namely the forces of dispersal and fragmentation and the forces of unification and standardization, right? So again, to understand that dispersal as always uh, accompanied by attempts to stabilize meaning, to fix meaning, et cetera. And that in fact, certain moments may, may be characterized historically by a greater presence of centripetal and uh, or centrifugal forces. And so I'll talk about that later and how we might historicize semiotic ecosystems. All right, so I'm going to deal with three, try to get through three topics in my rethinking of the relationship between translation and semiotics. 
First, I'm calling this from dissemination to accumulation or from between to among the semiotics of complex relationships. Then the semiotics of translational ecosystems or historicizing what Lotman called the semiosphere. And then finally, how to conceptualize translation practice through Piercean semiotics. So the first topic from dissemination to accumulation. So here I'm interested in how semiotics might help us conceptualize the complex relations generated by translation. And while many will acknowledge that there are complex transnational relationships, our models remain uh, enduringly binary, such as you know, Casanova's appropriation versus consecration, Venuti's foreignization versus domestication, and so on. And those binary models suggest the degree to which translation theory remains locked within as what people call the ontology of the modern nation state, right? That we have these individual standardized language and translation uh, happens uh, between the two. So what I'll be talking about in, in my uh, subsequent talks this week too, is how the transnational turn across the humanities in the last 10, 15 years has led them to face issues of translation. And I think from our point of view, compel us to develop more complex ways to talk about translation. So for example, moving from between to among. And so while I, I uh, again, share many of uh, Cobus Moray's uh, thoughts about the necessity for complexity thinking, it's interesting in his book that he almost invariably uses the preposition between as opposed to among, right? Between in English suggests between two things, whereas among, uh, among uh, a number more than two necessarily, right? So even if we just think of the very idea that translation, so many of these binaries are based on the assumption that translation somehow replaces the original, which of course it does not. The original continues to exist, to circulate and to accrue new interpretations and new translations across cultures, including in uh, the target culture. So even if a new translation of a work by Dostoevsky appears in English, for example, English Slavists will still be working with original Russian texts, but may quote the translation in their English language articles alongside the original and so on. So again, this proliferation of meanings or accumulation. Um, and then of course, uh, translation also takes its place among uh, various other translations of the original and various editions of the original, which of course continue to be uh, produced. So let me just give you three quick examples of, of, of the reality of this uh, complexity in translation. Just a few days ago, I was contacted by a Portuguese uh, publisher who is going to, is preparing an edition, a Portuguese edition of Yuri Lotman's The Unpredictable Workings of Culture. And they asked if they could include my translator's preface to the English translation. So the Portuguese edition will include a translation of my English translator's preface, but as the afterword, and I'm assuming there will also be a Portuguese translator's preface, right? So it's this accumulation of uh, meanings and of texts surrounding translation. A more complicated example involved the translation of the Georgian dissident Levan Berzendishvili's Gulag memoir, Sacred Darkness, which was originally written in Georgian. The publisher, however, purchased the translation rights to the Russian translation. So this is what Peter Bologna studies, indirect or relay translation. Why they did this, I'm not sure. Maybe they thought they couldn't find a Georgian translator. In any case, uh, toward the end of the project, the, the publisher sent me the Italian translation that had done, been done directly from the Georgian manuscript by a specialist in Georgian language and literature, and it contained a number of footnotes. And the publisher said, perhaps you'd like to consider adding some of these footnotes to your English translation. So I said, sure, and we looked at the, the footnotes, and I soon noticed that many of the places that were footnoted in the Italian translation had simply been omitted from the Russian. 
So instead of trying to explain it or footnote it, they just thought this is difficult and we'll get rid of it. So then I approached the publisher and I explained and I said, do you want me to restore those passages to the translation? Not even realizing that, of course, I would have had to do that from the Italian because I don't speak Georgian. And the publisher said, I think wisely, oh, there's probably a lot more omissions in the Russian, so don't open that can of worms. But there was an epigraph of a poem by the Georgian poet uh, uh, Galatian Tabidze that the author would like to have restored in the English translation. The Russian translators had cut that. So I agreed, thinking that I could find a Russian translation of Tabidze's poem, but that poem had never been translated, despite the fact that he was rather popular in Soviet Russia. So I ended up with the help of a of a colleague, Siri Niergaard, uh, tra we translated the Italian epigraph into English for this poem. So there was at least four languages involved in this, this translation of, uh, of uh, Verzenishvili's uh, memoir. And finally, another similar example is uh, from the translation history of the memoir of the 19th century French hermaphrodite Herculine Barbin. Uh, it was originally uh, published by Foucault in 1978. It's a very interesting edition because Foucault is very um, lightly present. He doesn't have an introduction. He doesn't put anything under his name in the table of contents, although he writes a short introduction to a section he calls Dossier. And, um, and this came out of his work in the archive. He wanted readers to be um, to have an almost unmediated experience of Herculine Barbin's voice. So you open it and it begins with Herculine Barbin's writings. Two years later, however, it's published in English, now with a rather lengthy uh, introduction by Foucault, a famous introduction, what is, is there a true sex? And with a short story by uh, an Austrian author, at the end, and of quite this elaborate subtitle and so on, which it claims to be the recently discovered manuscript, so discovered by Foucault. But if you see down here at the third image, that's actually the first publication in the 1870s by uh, Ambroise Tardieu. So it was hardly a discovery, maybe a rediscovery by Foucault, but hardly a discovery. Uh, in any case, uh, this 1980 English transit translation became the new original for most other translations. The only exception I think was the Russian translation, which was based on the 1978 French translation by Marussia Klimova. Uh, and so all of this attention to that 1980 English led the French to uh, propose a new edition of the memoir in which they, I think, reclaimed Foucault and reclaimed Arculine Barbin. And, but that new French edition is, of course, based on the 1980 English edition uh, and with an additional essay by uh, uh, Eric Fassin about, uh, you know, uh, translating. He, he uses the uh, kind of cultural studies use of translation, understanding uh, French and uh, uh, English uh, politics of, of, uh, of uh, queer politics and, and so on. So again, very complex history, which I think is not the exception, right? Um, that that it often involves more than one, I'm sorry, more than two languages and two cultures. And so I'm interested from a semiotic point of view, what I'm calling the stickiness of, and not just literary text, but I think Kirsten Malmkir very productively expanded uh, our frame to include key cultural texts. They acquire meanings. And so we go from you know, those traditional unidirectional transmission models to what uh, Loredana Poletzi called the ping pong model, where you know, texts will cross cultures, but they never un end, up, end up in the same place, right? So there's this unpredictability, it's, it's uh, separated from any idea of, of sameness. But now I'm suggesting something more like a snowball theory, where as these texts travel, they continually to accumulate uh, interpretations and in texts, but alongside, in, alongside the translation. So it's almost invariable with uh, Balbin that you also get an essay by a local scholar, 
in, uh, you know, discussing Balban, also the relevance to the target culture. So also in terms of thinking in a more complex way about translation, those binary models also typically erase the translator, right? So he's either part of the uh, one culture, another, or a neutral, invisible conduit, and so on. But when we start thinking about these complex relationships that translation creates, and again, start thinking in terms of among instead of between, the translator emerges in a new way. As, uh, for example, wonderful, um, something I'm fascinated by is this translation by the future Elizabeth I of England, Elizabeth Tudor, when she was only 11 years old, she translates uh, Marguerite de Navarre's Le Miroir de l'Âme Pécheureuse, which she presents to her stepmother, Queen Catherine Parr. Now she was, uh, of course, in an extremely precarious position in the Tudor court at this time after the death of her father, because of course her mother had been executed as an adulteress and many thought that she did not have a legitimate claim to the throne because now she was a bastard. Um, there is one article I found uh, dedicated to this translation, but it's um, interesting, but it takes a different point of view from what I'm trying to pursue here. It looks at it, the censorship and her revisions to this translation as revealing something about her relationship to her father, um, Henry VIII. But I, I'm interested in how, through this translation, Elizabeth places herself, again, among, in the company of two reformist queens. So Marguerite de Navarre, of course, was not Protestant, but she was known to be an Erasmian humanist and so a reformist in a way. Uh, and not only through proximity, but also by demonstrating her erudition, making her, you know, a uh, model humanist student and her piety at the same time by translating a uh, quasi-religious text, right? Uh, and it, uh, in doing so, one could say that she was already conceptualizing or laying a claim uh, for her right to rule or to succeed based on this notion of Protestant uh, humanism, right? And of course, uh, the translation, one could say, is also uh, haunted in a sense, by her deceased mother, Anne Boleyn, who was educated in the Netherlands and France. She was known for her beautiful French. Uh, and in fact, she was a maid of honor at uh, the court of a French uh, queen. So that's kind of what I'm trying to explore with this notion of uh, moving from between to among. And I also think that that would entail moving from beyond uh, either or to both and, right? So. Of course, translation is certainly a fact of the target culture, as Turi claimed, but it is not only a fact of the target culture. It never, uh, it also becomes a fact of the source culture. We see this every time an edition claims on the cover translated into 28 languages, right? So it's changing the status of the source text itself. It is changed through its translation. And in fact, I think the people in world literature have done a great job at highlighting this notion, and David Damrosch uh, in particular, who defines world literature as all literary works that circulate beyond their culture of origin, either in translation or in their original language, and else, elsewhere as works that gain in translation. Hence, the status of the original uh, changes through translation, one could say, is enhanced or at least altered. And of course, one of the most extensive theorizations of this comes from Karen Emmerich in her uh, monograph, Translation and the Making of Originals. Right, and so this is crucial, I think, in defining the specific cultural work of translated texts that distinguishes them from original writing. So there was that push in translation to study, studies to say, oh, translation is writing, and to, but I think uh, we have a lot more to be gained in isolating the specific cultural work of translated texts that distinguishes them from original writing. How uh, Elizabeth Tudor's translation let her do things that an original work of writing might not have done or would have had to do quite differently. So that's what I'm trying to, to get at here. And then to move on to uh, the next point, the semiotics of translational ecosystems. The idea that when often we theorized either the semiosphere or as Cobus Murray does, uh, these translation ecosystems 
they're ahistorical theorizations, right? That meaning happens in these systems in complex ways, but that the systems themselves can change, right? And may change through mm, a combination of different historical pressures and, and so on. So my argument is that this notion of semiotic, semiotic ecosystems allow us to historicize and situate the dynamics of meaning making itself, not just how meaning is made, but the specific kind of uh, force field in which a meaning is made. Now, Yuri Lutman was very interested in this, uh, in the moments of what he called explosion in semiotic systems, where meanings become unmoored and events unpredictable. Um, so again, the idea is that these semiotic systems do not behave eternally in the same way, but that they can be affected by a, a variety of forces. And then that the, the semiotic work that they do will be altered. It will be done in a different way. And I think uh, James Boyd White uh, also is trying to get at this notion in his monograph, when words lose their meaning, constitutions and reconstitutions of language, character, and community, in which he writes at the very beginning, when Thucydides wishes to express his sense of the internal chaos brought upon the cities of Greece by the civil wars that arose during the time of the Peloponnesian War, he tells us, among other things, that words themselves lost their meaning. The Greek terms for bravery and cowardice and trust and loyalty and manliness and weakness and moderation, the key terms of value in that world, changed their significance and their role uh, in uh, society and life. So recently I've been very interested in the Cold War as a very specific, a distinct semiotic ecosystem or even force field that is characterized by radical polarization, right? Which has the capacity then to appropriate virtually anything into binaries, right? So this was, and if, if Traditionally, Western uh, translation studies is located, the birth of the field is located in that period. So I'm also interested in investigating how that uh, affected that, that birth, that weird polarized uh, semiotic system, which still uh, lives on today in the, in the polarization, polarization we see in, in the post-communist uh, world. And my thinking here has been shaped in many ways by scholarship in the field of visual studies, uh, such as John Curley's Global Art in the Cold War, where he writes, even disputes at their start had little or nothing to do with the Cold War, morphed into important battlegrounds for the conflict. This is a time when art itself, artistic forms were uh, forced into these binaries. So this is when abstract art through uh, support from the US government uh, became associated with uh, Western, uh, specifically American individualism and freedom and where representational art became associated with, uh, you know, totalitarian, totalitarianism and, and so on. This was a Cold War phenomenon and it happened across, across the arts. And again, with much funding on either side uh, of the, the Iron Curtain. And in fact, I, uh, Edward Said makes a similar point in his book on uh, uh, culture and empire, where he says, um, uh, he talks about the phenomenally incorporative capacity of modern media culture, which makes it possible for anyone, in fact, to say anything at all, uh, but everything then is processed. Uh, either toward the dominant mainstream or out to the margins. So again, these are this is what I'm trying to get at with this notion of uh, specific moments within semiotic ecosystems that we have to look deeper, not in just how meaning is made, but the very, mm, as I say, almost semiotic force field in which meaning is constructed. And so uh, this was a time in that period, if we're talking, uh, looking at the history of translation, this is a time in history where translation becomes a symbol. So those of us who teach translation are often 
uh, are used to telling our students translation can be either a product or a process. It can also be a symbol, and this is important from a semiotic point of view, of course. And this is a speech by Alexander Fadeev on the cause of world peace from 1949, so the beginning of the Cold War period, in which he just lists all of the translations that were being done in the Soviet Union in enormous circulations, right? And what's interesting to me about this quote is he has, says nothing about the quality of the translations, right? Uh, he doesn't say, oh, these translations are important because they're of such great quality. It's just the number, the sheer number uh, define the Soviet Union as internationalist, as interested in other cultures, uh, and so on. And that wasn't unique to Russia. This, this quoting of statistics is probably uniquely Soviet, but I found examples in on the other side of the Iron Curtain. For example, in a 1950 review by the poet W.H. Auden of a collection of Greek poetry and translation, he writes toward the very end, quote, every translator is an international agent of goodwill, right? So this, this Cold War a uh, semiotic ecosystem makes translation into uh, a symbol. And again, quality is not essential to that symbolic uh, connotation that a uh, translation acquires because Auden's review is not terribly uh, positive of this collection. Right. Moreover, uh, Auden was among those post-war writers who were enlisted by the British and UF, U.S. governments and sent abroad as cultural emissaries, right? Making his use of agent here <laughs> sound a little bit like a Freudian slip. Uh, but I'm quoting here uh, Andrew Rubin's excellent book, Archives of Authority, where he talks about uh, government sponsorship of translation uh, in the Cold War. Uh, and again, translation also in that period became caught up in one of the great Cold War binaries, which was science versus art. Uh, and that's discussed, of course, in C.B. Snow's famous 1959 Reed Lecture, of course, the same year as uh, Jakobsen's essay called The Two Cultures where he writes, I believe the intellectual life of the whole of Western society is increasingly being split into two polar groups, scientists and intellectuals. By the way, he describes uh, intellectuals as traditionalists. So even though he's trying to say that these are, this is a binary, binary, as usually happens with binaries, it's hierarchized. And so the scientists are associated with modernity and the intellectuals with the past and uh, tradition. Right, and so through the seen through the lens of that binary, the history of translation studies can be seen quite differently. So we're all familiar with James Holmes's famous essay on the name and nature of translation studies, but in which he construed pre-war writings on translation as, quote, incidental and desultory, meaning there was nothing there or it was random. And then suddenly we get what I would suggest is the more scientific scholarly approach to translation. But as I began to question that, uh, which came out of my study of the Soviets, which uh, in which pre-war writings could not in any stretch of the imagination be described as incidental and desultory. They were quite theoretically sophisticated already in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, but also my bibliographic research on pre-war Western writings revealed something quite different. It wasn't that there was nothing and then there was something, or that there was random incidental desultory work and then uh, a serious scholarly work. It was that pre-war writings were framed, framed translation almost invariably as art. This is just a short list beginning in the late 19th century in, in all of the European language, though Die Kunst des Übersetzen, uh, the Russian Iskustvipedia, or the art of translation, Laude Traduir, in all the, uh, all the cultures. This goes on and on uh, through the time. What happens after the war is you get a reframing of translation as science or technology, know-how, and the technique of translation. Uh, translation can be mechanized, a de technique, and, and of course an interest in uh, machine translation, problem of translation, no more art. And of course this culminates in uh, 
Nidus 1964, the science of translation, right? And so that shift becomes even more evident when we compare works by the same author produced before and after the war. So compare Vladimir Nabokov's The Art of Translation from 1941 to his Problems of Translation in 1955. And so that's why I would inscribe Jakobsen's in that Cold War uh, atmosphere in which science is being promoted over art. Um, and he, in a sense, capitulates to this scientific notion that, uh, informed by early advances in machine translation, that content can be extracted from form, right? When at the end of his essay, he argues that literary works in which form and content are inseparable require creative transposition, right? He doesn't even call it translation. Um, and this is actually the Russian a Russian formalist precept that form and content in literary works is inseparable. And Russian formalist informed translation studies scholars like Andrei Fyodorov would never back away from that. But here we see, I think, Jakobsen's capitulation to the discourse of science. And we see this in early Western writings from the 50s, this notion that uh, translations uh, Basically, you, you, you do translation by extracting content from form. As we look in A.H. Smith's uh, 1958, um, he says to translate is, as Dr. Johnson defined it, to change into another language, retaining sense. It would perhaps be wiser to qualify this definition and suggest that to translate is to change into another language, retaining as much of the sense as one can, for some of the original effect is almost always lost. So some, but suggesting that most of it can be retained. Or as Leonard Forster says, I want to consider translation as the transference of the content of a text from one language to another, bearing in mind that we cannot always disassociate the form from the content. Again, that form, the inseparability of form from content becomes um, an exception to the rule. Then, of course, in 1966, we get the report of the Automated Language Processing Advisory Committee uh, and uh, I don't know what relationship there is between the two, but not long after that, we get the so-called hermeneutic turn in translation studies, which was manifested in the discovery of Walter Benjamin's paper, Die Aufgabe des, uh, des Übersetzes, originally published in 1923. This resulted in the first English translation in 1968, followed by the first French translation in 71. Um, so I don't know if it's a, again, like the Barbin memoir, is it a discovery or a rediscovery? I don't know. In any case, that discovery of Benjamin's essay uh, always presents it as kind of an isolated event, right? That he was a voice in the desert, a light in the darkness of pre-war writings on translation. But however, if we look at the, at the writings of Paul Cower, whose work Die Kunst des Übersetzens came out in four editions, uh, revised editions and enlarged editions before the First World War. It is very likely that Benjamin knew the work, which was used in many uh, high schools that taught the classics. So even a cursory look at Cower's book suggests that it is not a dilettantish collection of random musings on translation art. Uh, there's an extensive introduction, and then it's divided into three major sections titled Synonymy, Word Order, and Syntax. Right. Uh, also noteworthy is Cower's prominent use of Aufgabe or task in the title of both the introduction and conclusion, right, which is much discussed in uh, Benjamin's essay, as well as Fortleben, uh, which is an Überleben, which are used in Bakhtin. So again, or in, in Benjamin's essay. So I'm ne not suggesting that Benjamin took this from Cower, but we, we would, we could inscribe Benjamin in his moment as opposed to making him seem like some uh, prophet in the wilderness if we looked at this uh, pre-war writing in greater detail. And finally, let me very quickly say how semiotics might influence a translation practice. And these thoughts came both from current translation projects of mine, but also from a volume I did on, uh, I'm currently doing on Russian art, which led me to go back and read the work of Norman Bryson, who was actually a professor of English who revolutionized art history by applying uh, semiotics uh, and philosophy of language to uh, art history, and specifically a Piercean semiotics notion. So as I say, it came 
its relevance uh, came as I was working on uh, the translation of, of Sasha Filipianka's Krasny Kriest, which is just coming out. Um, and I'll try to explain very quickly why. So important here is uh, Pierce's distinction between an icon, an index, and a symbol. Uh, the symbol is the most arbitrary of all signs. Icons and index control or attempt to control meaning. Icon from the inside, so some form of the sign will look like its content or try to uh, represent its content. In that way, it tries to uh, limit the arbitrariness of the uh, relationship between signified and signifier, at least somewhat, but from the inside, whereas the index tries to restrict it from the outside by referencing a dogma or a code or something like that. So we could even see today the ISO standards, right? Their terminology uh, lists would be indexes. Their equivalents, not because there's something inherent uh, in that term that makes them the perfect equivalent, but because ISO uh, enforces them as the equivalent, right? So it's the indexicality of that word. So just one note on uh, here, we see a different use of symbol in Saussure and in uh, Pierce. In Saussurean semiotics, a symbol is a sign in which the relationship between the signifier and signifies is less arbitrary than with general words. Uh, he gives the image of justice blindfolded and carrying a scale, whereas in Piercean semiotics, the meaning of a symbol is the most open or the least fixed. And his, uh, so Saussure's so example of justice would be an icon in Piercean semiotics. And so quickly, um, Norman Bryson uses these terms in a really interesting way to understand the history of art and how a religious painting, especially in the early Christian period, uh, during the time of what he calls looking at Byzantine stencils, the representation of figures like the Virgin Mary there at the bottom um, is extremely stylized. There are no personal features. Her head is always bent. She's always has something uh, over her head and so on. Uh, the purpose of that, uh, this would he, he would call an index, and the purpose is to is for recognition that it draws the, the, the viewer to that biblical passage that is being referenced, right? And causes the viewer then to contemplate the nature of the religious content there. So the image serves to index the religious content. But what happens in the early Renaissance period is you get you start to get this additional, what he calls connotational information involved in the representation. It's not merely the bare bones indexicality of the stencil, but you start to see as he describes it, the, the fact that you get a mirroring effect between Judas and Christ in this image of the betrayal and so on. The, and that connotational information is subject to interpretation in a way that the index is not. And that becomes, uh, we see that in high Renaissance art we, where we get this uh, tension between the indexicality of the image, which is supposed to lead us to uh, the religious content. And here uh, in Il Sodomo's uh, representation of St. Sebastian, where the, the, the realist representation leads you to linger on the body uh, as, a cetera, as opposed to uh, contemplate the religious content. So interesting to me was how this notion was developed in uh, by Russian conceptual artists, uh, specifically Dmitry Prigov in his notion of shimmering, which Daniel Lieberman describes as a counter ideological strategy in late Soviet art. So they weren't simply trying to undermine social realists by maybe doing abstract art, which could then, of course, have been uh, interpreted as a Western gesture. Instead, they were trying to situate themselves in a more complex way. And as Lieberman, Lederman describes it, in Prigov's understanding, shimmering consists of a disciplined strategy of oscillation between mutually exclusive ideological and or metaphysical discourses from profound investment in the artwork to utter detachment, critical distance and merciless ana analysis, and then back again, a trajectory intended to prevent or preempt the consolidation of an authoritative artistic voice or artwork. 
right? And so one way to understand this in semiotic terms is an isolation or oscillation, I'm sorry, between indexicality and symbolism. Not simply replacing indexes with symbols, but creating an uncertainty around index, uh, indexicality as to whether or not it has a symbolic shimmering or not. Could it be read as a symbol, right? So how do you endow the index, not with symbolic content, but with the effect of symbolic shimmering? Now, th this is related to these notions are discussed in the semiotics of literature, of course, most famously by Roland Barthes in his notion of the reality effect, in which he says in works of realist fiction, you often get random physical things that never come back up in the text mentioned. Those would serve in the Piercean uh, schema as indices, right? They were just trying to index social reality. You recognize who Madame Bovary is because of this, you know, parental piece of furniture and this uh, piano that she has and, 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 and so on. Now, not all signs, of course, in realist fiction are indices or exclusively indices, although realists were indeed ambivalent about overt symbology which was associated with religiosity, sentimentality, and so on. And so again, it's no coincidence that the symbolist movement comes as a reaction to realism and naturalism and so on. Uh, in any case, Yuri Lukman grapples with this semiotic problem uh, in his essay, The Symbol in the System of Culture, where he talks about the use of indices in realist, uh, uh, the realist fiction of Turgenev, et cetera, as symptoms. They were trying to diagnose a social illness. And so these uh, they use these um, realist effects, uh, these, these indices of social problems. But Dostoevsky says was different because he perceived newspaper reports and facts concerning criminal cases as both symbols or indices and, I'm sorry, symptoms and symbols. And this relates to key aspects of his artistic and philosophical thinking. In other words, he endows these symbols or symptoms with an with a symbolic shimmering effect, right? That suggests they may be symbols. And this is what uh, Lutman writes. While representing the speech of various characters and of the narrator himself, these passages select them almost at random are characterized by one common feature. The words do not designate things and ideas, but only hint at them, while also suggesting the impossibility of arriving at an exact designation. The phrase, and another thing, becomes a marked sign of the entire style of the novel, which is built on endless clarifications and reservations, which, however, clarify nothing and only demonstrate the impossibility of any definitive clarification. So, in terms of translation, how this might be relevant in translation practice, and I'll end with this, is that our norms for translating realist prose typically eliminate, I would argue, this shimmering effect by translating place names and proper names through transliteration or adopting them exactly. They're rarely translated, right? And in this way, they are rendered pure indices because the danger, of course, is them is giving them too much a symbolic weight. But I encounter this problem in Russian literature often as to whether to, to translate Vyelike Tetschestvene Vaina as World War II or the Great Fatherland or the Great Patriotic War. Now, the literal translation is the Great pa Fatherland War, but it's you have to make a decision. Are you referring just to the war in its entirety? Is it an index? Or do you want to lend it some symbolic shimmering? Because the Great Fatherland War refers specifically to Russia's, or the Soviet Union's, participation in the war. And it references the Napoleonic invasion, which is referred to as the Fatherland War, right? So do you want to create some kind of symbolic shimmering or not, right? And I encountered this again when I was translating uh, Sasha Filipenko's novel, uh, Red Crosses, in which one of the running motifs is obvious from the title, it's the cross, but the other one is a bridge and it appears again and again and again. And one of the uh, buildings mentioned in uh, where the lead character works is called Kuznetsky Most Street, 
Now, street names are almost invariably transliterated, and I looked at all the tourist literature and so on. So that's what I went with initially. But as it became clear that bridge was a central motif, I thought I need to lend this more symbolic shimmering. So I ended up with Kuznetsky Bridge Street, uh, which is in slight violation of the norms for translating. But I was affected by this notion that I thought I needed to render this with some uh, symbolic shimmering. And let me end with this example that, that is from the Dutch, which I, I heard in a very interesting talk given recently at a conference by two uh, scholars at Leiden University on the retranslation of uh, the Great Gatsby into Dutch. And they were looking specifically on gender, right? And how Daisy Buchanan is represented. And they talked about this uh, passage. She laughed again as if she said something very witty and held my hand for a moment, looking up into my face, promising that there was no one in the world uh, she so much wanted to see. That was a way she had. This word away becomes mannerism. Actually, they use a diminutive form of mannerism in the Dutch. And this struck me as uh, interesting and, and as, as going, uh, as speaking to the exact problem I was talking about. I would argue that way in English, unmodified, has a symbolic shimmering based on its co kind of, um, collocational usage. Mannerism does not. Mannerism, especially a diminutive form of mannerism, is an index and a pure index, like she has some tick, right? But if we look at the semantics of way in English, it means facility, to have a way with people, a way with words, to have one's way with someone, it suggests power, and of course, knowledge. I am the way, the truth, and the light. So unmodified way, and, and the, the very laconicism of modernist writing is what endows these words with a symbolic shimmer, in our, I would argue, which is absent in the diminutive form of mannerism. And so when uh, Tchaikovsky in his critique of formal equivalence argues that the most precise or little translation, literal translation is often the least accurate, and that even when all the formal features of a text have been represented in a translation, the text ni shevelitsa, it doesn't stir, it doesn't come alive, or I might say doesn't shimmer, right? It doesn't leave open the possibility of this symbolic Meaning. So to conclude, let me just say on the basis of uh, Piercean semiotics, we might better theorize the accumulation of meaning as opposed to the dispersal of meaning and the complex relationships created through translation. We might develop different approaches to translating different kinds of texts, right? Does realist fiction require a different approach to translation. Typically, our approach is a, a little bit of a one-size-fits-all for literary text. Uh, and, and does it allow us to historic, historicize semi-auto uh, ecosystems, giving us uh, new ways uh, to understand the translator's task uh, that are relevant maybe to practicing translators? Uh, and I'll end there. Sorry for going on. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Brian, Brian, I'm hearing an echo, which is creating, is creating a, a shimmering in our heads. So thank <laughs> you, so much, Brian, for this inspired and inspiring uh, introductory lecture, uh, which encourages us to make reflection about translation a bit more complicated, more sophisticated by drawing on um, semiotics. And I think um, we are curious about what semiotics uh, can offer us, and, and we will um, think about this in the course of the following two weeks. Uh, we still have a little bit of time for uh, questions, not too much, but we can uh, continue the discussion uh, tomorrow. So if somebody has a, a question, um, I think Brian will be happy to take it right now or a comment. I have a question, if yeah, nobody yeah. else has. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so thank you so much for this re really interesting talk. Um, I was very interested in this um, development of conceptualizing translation as art and a science um, before the, the war, the Great War and afterwards. And um, I wondered if uh, the 
invention or the research on machine translation has something to do with it? Sorry, I muted myself because I thought I was causing the feedback. Um, yes, I undoubtedly, uh, I think Tomoshko is right that uh, code breaking in the war, advances in machine translation really influenced that and they were part of that culture of science and people were seduced by it. But whereas uh, Tomosko situates that as the beginning of post-positivism or, or marks the beginning of translations move away from, I think it's the opposite. I think it's when positivism was injected deep into translation thinking. And that's why the West had such a terribly difficult time uh, moving away from equivalence, where again, this was dismissed theoretically by the Russians and Ukrainians in the 20s. Um, so yeah, it's it's it shares some of uh, Tomoshko's readings, but the interpretation I give them is, is somewhat different. If we look at it in the framework of this uh, genuflecting before science, Can I ask a question too? I don't know whether you can hear me. Yeah, sure. Um, it's just... Thank you. Um, I, um, uh, Brian, I'd like to ask particularly about the thing you mentioned about the link between the ALPAC report and the rediscovery of Felter Benjamin. You said it quite quickly. I just wondered whether you could elaborate on that a little bit. It was fascinating. <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh, so I don't know if there's a cause and effect, but it's quite interesting to me that that report comes out in 66. This previous discourse on translation and science is very heavily influenced by machine translation. And then suddenly we get this redis or the discovery of Benjamin in this hermeneutic turn. And I, I think, again, we the machine stuff kind of reached a dead end there. And I think whether there's a direct cause and effect or whether it's some deep cultural thing, I don't know, but the timing seems very interesting to me. That's Thank all you. I'm prepared to say. I'm <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I have a question from Christina, but Brian, first, I think you can stop sharing your screen right now. Oh, I thought uh, I had. Mm -hmm. We see ourselves a double. Uh, Christina, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. Um, you mentioned how practitioners are very diffident of uh, theory, and I was wondering if you think theoreticians are also diffident of practitioner, uh, practitioners? Yes, yes. I mean, I think we have some kind of uh, obligation to demonstrate the relevance of theory uh, to practitioners and our role as teachers, especially. Um, why do people need to, to study this and how do we make it? So uh, one of the things I've been trying to do is, again, demystify theory by let's just say it's a way you conceptualize translation, which is undoubtedly very closely related to the way you conceptualize language, right? And so if we uh, accept that languages, natural languages are non-equivalent codes are asymmetrical, that most words are polysemous, then you will always have a choice to make uh, in your translation. What should guide your decision making, right? And I think that way of, of demystifying theory is one, once we can connect it uh, in that way and make it relevant, then we can start you know, uh, spiraling up, as they say. But I was a, a little horrified as translation programs were cropping up in the US and coming out of comparative literature programs. They were teaching practice courses and invariably one of the first texts they gave the students was Benjamin's Task of the Translator, which is a fascinating essay. But if I was teaching someone how to translate, it's not the first text I give them. Um, so yes, I think I think we have a great obligation to the practitioners to, to connect it and to uh, show why and to scaffold it, right? As you would scaffold a language when you're teaching it, you need to scaffold the theory, you know? Thank you very much, Brian. Any more questions or remarks? No, okay. I think we can uh, maybe conclude this opening session and continue the debates uh, tomorrow and in the days to follow uh, so that uh, all the participants who are on quite a tight uh, scheme can get uh, some fresh air uh, because they will spend some other time in front of their screens today.
to make themselves familiar with the webinars. Uh, and you are also entitled to a drink, which you will have to offer yourself. So I hope your fridge is filled with uh, alcoholic or non-alcoholic uh, drinks and maybe some finger foods. So thank you so much, Brian, for your inspiring and inspired lecture with uh, very nice examples. Um, and uh, we hope to learn more uh, tomorrow. So uh, see you all uh, tomorrow. And thank you for having attended the opening session in such a great number. See you and take care. Bye, thank you. Hello.